Shall we look to the Lord? Father, we do glorify your name this morning. We do thank you, Almighty God, for the privilege of this coming together of your people. Father, we know how the enemy would love to pre prevent this and to destroy everything that's akin to unity. But we take a stand against the powers of darkness. Lord, thou dost know the need that's represented in every heart and only thou art able to fulfill that need. Bless your servant this morning and our bodies and our mind, our souls undertake in a mighty way. May the enemy be bound uh, forthwithly in Jesus Christ's name. Bless that soul that's wandering afar, that soul that's closest to hell. Have your own way, give unction, give guidance, give anointing. We don't want to speak one word that you would have us not speak, but we want to declare the whole counsel of God. So have thine own way, glorify yourself. And we feel that our purpose will have been fulfilled. We ask this blessing in the righteous name of Christ Jesus and for his sake. Amen. In the fifth chapter, you pray for us, our voice is afflicted. We, in the room this morning, some of the ministers were gathered together. So we asked those who were clear and didn't feel that they had the message to just uh, make their way out and they all went out and left me in there. <laughs> so, so here we are. You pray for us. Praise <laughs> God. We'll begin reading verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their own wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it, cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. But we are members of the body of his flesh and of his bones. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning the church, Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife, as she reverence her husband. We would like to talk to you this morning about the blameless church. We would like to sing a couple of verses of a song, number 415 in your hymnal. Preceding this, please. A couple of verses, if we will. You all join in with us, if you will. The Blameless Church. We should be able to sing this song with enthusiasm. Amen. Are you a part of it? Are you glad about it? Praise God. 
Amen. All right, shall we sing? Without spotting, sing good for the glory. Glory to God. And be without without the faith. Suffer for this what God bless. Speak without body blame. Leave my brother. Blame me the old blood. Glory to God. Praise God. Builder and maker is God. Thank God. This of life, glory, she reigns over sin. All the glory to God. Praise God. Our Father, praise God. She lived in your cleaning blood. Praise God. This song was born out of a vision. During the time that this song was written, they didn't write song because they sounded good or because they fit the uh, contemporary melody, but they wrote songs out of a vision. Did you know the origin of a song has something to do with the effectiveness of it? Did you know that? See, people are writing songs today commercially. Trying to appeal to the senses with the objective entertainment. And usually when that is the objective, that's all that it accomplishes. Amen. But brother, when the, the time when this song was written, the church had come back to Mount Zion. After having been in darkness and cloudiness for several centuries. And the saints of God were rejoicing in their freedom and that they had seen reenacted what they had read in the Bible. When you can re, uh, rejoice because a song fits your experience, your rejoicing is good. Amen. They had read about a blameless church. They had longed and wept for one. But the time had come when they had finally come back to it. This is a serious matter. I looked up the word blameless. This is the definition. Innocent. Guilt. Less. Amen. Along every line. I want you to notice the singular aspect of the church. Do you notice in this uh, 24th 25th, I believe, and 26th verse, the word it is used several times indicating and proving that God only has one. That God will not come to select somebody from every man-made organization and take them back with him. But the Bible says he's coming back for his church. And that's all we'll be prepared to go back with him. View it as we will. Now, the one, the responsibility of making the church blameless before the coming of Christ is not an individual thing. You pray with me. It's not my responsibility, nor yours individually. It is our responsibility collectively. Now there's a reason why the church was not blameless down through the years. 
They couldn't sing this song for about 12 or 1300 years. Why? Because the church was not in condition to do so. Where? They fumbled the ball somewhere along the way and it took them about 14 or 1500 years to get back where they were. Do you want that tells me something not only about the church but by my life individually. You can let the devil put you off in a point they want and it take you years if you ever get back where you were. Why? Your whole perspective gets off. You don't even see things like you used to see. That light that you have will become darkness. God help us. This is a tremendous responsibility and it is all of our responsibility. I appreciate good singing and shouting and whatnot, dear one, but I'm not convinced that this is altogether time for shouting. Amen. Why? We have a long ways to go and a short time to get there. Amen. See, now say what we will and be as stubborn as we please and hold out for what we will, but Christ is only coming back for a blameless church. Not in my estimation. Not in your estimation. But he will determine what's blameless. Amen. Now many times they want you might depend on your strong points. And everybody has some. Come on. And we can be deceived because of our strong points. Because we stand so firm on this or that or the other. But they want to go back with Christ. We're going to have to be blameless everywhere. The Bible says Ephraim was a cake unturned. Meaning he was black on the bottom and raw on the top. And that's a possibility of us being that, D1. Amen. We can go aboard here and allow this to go on together. But D1, we are living in a time where we need to do some close examining. And I mean every last one of us. D1, that's the purpose of this meeting. Praise our God. That's why I say I give you liberty. If we're not there, we're willing to go. D1, I'm not going to call you off in a corner after the meeting's all over so you preach it too strong for me. Amen. Why? Our people are open, dear one. If we have to take a stand, we'll take it. If we have to put it away, we'll put it away. If we need to take it on, we'll take it on. Why? Because we haven't arrived yet. And if we are careful, we won't. Praise the living God. All right, then. When this song was written, Church of God was enjoying a glory and a power that had not been witnessed since the days of the apostles. Why? Because the things that had hindered her had finally been removed through the clear and pungent preaching of the gospel. The devil realizes that the only effective church is a blameless church. You see, dear one, we don't make Christ work for us because of our insistence because we throw ourselves out on him but Christ has a law that he works by and either we come up to that law and get his favor or we violate it and be rejected amen so he knows what pleases him he has already prescribed what he's coming back for amen alright then what did happen over in the book of Jude, shall we turn there? Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Sanctified people are preserved. They don't spoil too easily. Thank God. We'll throw that in in passing. Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, Lord help us. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, I just wanted to exhort you a little. I just wanted to write and talk about the Lord. But conditions were of such, even before the death of the apostle, that he had just had to include something else. Brother, you can hardly talk now without talking about the apostasy. You can hardly preach now without preaching about the apostasy. Why? Because that's all that we find in the land. 
And brother, we're struggling with all of our might to try to stay out of it ourselves. Amen. If you're uncaring, sometimes it looks pretty dark. But Jesus says, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It might not be too numerically strong, but you'll have somebody to come back for. And we are endeavoring by the grace of God to be in that small number. All right? Said I had set out to write to you about the common salvation, but it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you, not fussing at you, not blasting you, not trying to skin you, but exhort you. There's a difference, dear one. The Bible says exhorting one another. Exhorting one another. That's what we need. We need to stay in a place where we can be exhorted. Amen. We're not out to take nobody's hide. We're not out to skin nobody alive, but to exhort, but to encourage. Amen. That you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints of God. I'm wondering if you see the seriousness of this thing. Even before the death of the apostles, they're already fighting, trying to get back where they were. Under that strong preaching, observing miracles and everything else. But Jude has to write a letter like this before the death of the apostles. Paul said, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Despite me preaching to you two or three times a day, despite me standing against everything that's ungodly, the mystery of iniquity is still working. Why is it mysterious? What is the mystery? Something that's dark, something that's difficult to discern. Iniquity is of such that it's working. You don't know how it began or when it began. You just look around and you find it there. And brother, I'm afraid that most of us would have to make the same admission. We look around sometimes, we preach, we hold standards, we fight sin and worldliness, but if you're uncaring, you look around and here it is. And just when you thought you had it all situated, you look again and here it is here. That's why we have to keep a constant fight in our soul. And once you can see to it, once you leave it alone, and you're done. Lord, help us, bless us. Contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. All right then, here is the beginning of the end of the blameless church. What happened? For there are certain men crept in unawares. Lord help us. Who were before of old ordained of this condemnation? Will you follow me? Will you pray with me? Certain men crept in unawares. Bringing in false doctrines, false practices crept in, did not announce their coming, and the ministry were sleeping, unable to detect what was happening. They looked around and it was there, and it had gone out of proportion before they recognized it. Will you pray with me? Do well, let me show you something. That's why the Bible calls a minister a watchman. Why? I have literally watched congregations go into apostasy. How? For this very reason. Why? Allow things to creep in. They don't just kick the door down and walk in. Crept in. Through the back door. And well, that's singular. But brother, it's going to be just like a pack of rats or mice. You get one in there, you look around, you got a whole nest of them. And when you recognize that they're there, the exterminator himself cannot get rid of them. Come on. Started with one little insignificant mouse, and now you have a whole uh, infestation. You got a whole group of them. The trap won't help you any now. Here, when I saw it happen in Detroit some years ago, how that this jewelry problem took a church off into apostasy. The minister decided that because he was handsome and the girl was uh, picking at him, he needed to wear a ring to prove that he was married. So he did it. And the people made a little noise at first and then quietened down. And after a while, brother, they came in with rings and earrings and paint and everything else. And he saw it was getting out of hand and he tried to stop it. He tried to put thumb down. He said, no, this is going too far. 
But brother, he opened the door. And when he tried to close, he couldn't. Amen. Now he gave a good plausible reason why he did it. But after he opened the door, brother, he tried to close it. And they kicked it down. He said, but I'm just wearing a ring. Well, I'm just wearing earrings. But I'm doing it for this reason. I'm doing it for that reason. See, everybody has their reasons. And if they don't have one, they'll manufacture one. Amen. God help us. They crept in. Otherwise, while men slept, while men slept, the Bible says, the enemy sold tears. Who were before of old ordained of this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, licentiousness, liberality, sensuality, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Savior, Jesus Christ. And brother, this was the beginning because of the power, it couldn't go down quickly too quickly you know I observed the fire last week and I went about three days later after they had doused it with water and everything else and they dug some of the rubbish out from underneath it was still smoldering why it was burning too high it couldn't go out immediately but the fire for all practical purposes was gone well by the same thing they want you don't just fade out overnight that's what deceives people even if you do something that's questionable in your own life you might shout for months. You might enjoy some of the things you've always enjoyed. But many times, the deterioration is so gradual. Even the congregation that I mentioned, they want, it was a gradual thing. And it was hard to convince them. Why? Because they were still getting a lot of people in. They were still expanding their buildings. By every outward standard, they were still being blessed. And they want, it's hard to convince an individual when they feel that they're still being blessed. Oh, Lord. Brother, we have something on our hand now. You need to go to some of these places. You need to observe some things. You know, they have a theory today that if a person is in a questionable situation, let them prove themselves. And if they, I guess if they do good and they can preach well and do this well, they are all right. But they want, when the word is already spoken, they are already proven. Amen. Come on. When the word is clear, there is no other proving necessary. All right, then. Over Galatians chapter 2. God help us. Praise the living God. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed for their before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Paul said, I withstood in faith the faith because he was to be blamed. Paul, that we're trying to have a blameless church, brother apostle, but here you are blamable. Amen. But I thank God for the humility of Peter. I thank God for the courage of Paul. Brother, let me tell you something. Thank God if I'm bringing a reproach, if I'm letting down the standards, if we get worried around here, take me aside, glory to God, and let me know, brother Heaven, we're trying to hold a standard. We're trying to preach a standard here. We're trying to get the church back up to where it ought to be so we can see ears open and eyes open and bones knit back together. Amen. But you're making it blamable by your corrupt practices, by what you are allowing. And brother, I leave out with tears. If you'll help me, thank God I'll do whatever is necessary to recover myself. Amen. Peter goes, I'm an apostle just like you are. And brother, he has some support too. Why? Because Barnabas was right with him. He could have went out and started him a whole new organization. See, you can't bring me under bondage to your fanatical ideas. I won't be under bondage to nobody. But brother, he recognized the spirit of God working in his brother. The Bible that be subject one to the other. Why? Wow. We're watching for your souls. Amen. You guard the front door and I guard the back door. 
This has to be a unified effort. Amen. Praise our God. Paul had courage and he recognized that if God is to continue to work as he's working, we will have to have a blameless church. But Peter, you're to be blamed. You're going contrary to your teaching. You're teaching one thing, you're practicing another thing. And it's serious. And you got these people confused. Should you eat with the Gentiles or shouldn't you? Are the Jews and Gentiles still a separate people or aren't they? Has the middle wall of partition been torn down or has it not? Oh, let's take a stand then. Let's get this matter clear. These poor people don't know which way to go. And you are to be blamed. But Peter recognized the authority in the Apostle Paul. Amen. Let me show you this, dear one. That's what the ministry is all about. Amen. What, when you recognize, dear one, I recognize the authority in my brethren who are standing. Amen. I can be separate. We have a uh, our congregation here that could be self-consistent uh, and, uh, and, and uh, containing and what have you, they want. But I recognize the authority that God has vested in you. I recognize your concern about my personal interests, about the interests of the kingdom of God. And brother, this is a tremendous thing we're dealing with. A blameless church. And despite all of our unified efforts, if we aren't careful, we'll fall short. As I was telling you last night, dear one, I recognized it more a couple of months ago than ever before. Why? I realized that we just could not stand alone. I had to call. I was calling here and there. People were calling in and say we're supporting you. We're praying for you and people I didn't even know. And I was telling everybody, thank you. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes I'm a little discriminating, but then, praise our God, say, thank you. But you can pray, pray. Praise our God, we need some help here. Glory to God forever. <laughs> Amen. Praise the living God. Sometimes I'm asking, where are you from? And this and that and the other. But then I was in pray. Glory to God. <laughs> Praise the living God. And guess what? Before it's over, you're going to be saying pray too. Amen. Amen. You're going to want some help from anywhere you can get it. Amen. That's why we need a blameless church. Why? Our back will get the wall. And either we come out the Bible way or we perished. We would have been a gazing stock and a laughing stock of the whole world. God planned it that way. to go through if you're willing to sacrifice, if you're willing to get over to God like your order, I'll bring you out more than conquer. But otherwise, you'll be a hiss and you'll be a byword. And brother, I'm going to tell you something. Let me tell you something this morning. You might think you're blameless. You might think you're searching. But God can put you in some situation. You'll search your life all over and clean out your closet again and clean out your bookshelf and everything else. Brother, I, did, I thought I didn't have anything else to dig up. But I was making new vows and new oaths and Throwing away things and I don't know what all I wasn't doing. Why? I want to ask the Lord, I've got to survive this thing. All that I have is hinging on the outcome of this thing. I can't afford to be wrong. I can't take no long shot here. I said, now if I've got to do this more, I'll do it more. If I've got to do this less, I'll do that less. Whatever. Wherever. Whatever the price, I'm willing to do it because if I fail here, nothing else matters anyway. Come on. Brother, I dug places that I'd already dug before. I reviewed things that I'd already said that I had settled. I put away things that I thought that I'd already justified. I want to tell you something, dear one. It's going to be your turn before it's all over. This is a tremendous thing. What God is allowing these things what, to purify the church. To bring her where she ought to be. And brother, according to the word of God, she's got a way to go before Jesus comes, whether it's tomorrow or whether it's next year. All right. Christ himself will determine what's blameless. And the ones, that's all that he's coming back for. That's all. You see, as I said before, I might have a personal idea or scruple that might, in my own estimation, make me above you and you and you. You might hold a little stand that you think that makes you superior. But brother, Christ is going to determine what's blameless. We can have all the personal ideas and close uh, uh, conduct and 
all of the strict rules we want to, brother, but Christ is going to determine who's blameless and who's not blameless. I won't be able to do that. Amen. If I'm not careful, I'll be rejected along with the crowd. Amen. That's why over in St. John chapter 12, verse 48, the Bible says, He that rejected me and receiveth not my words have one that will judge him in the last day. The word that I have spoken, the words that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last days. Why will Christ be the judge? Because Christ knows what he meant when he said it. Will you pray with me through here? You see, dear one, when we come to a controversial scripture or to a controversial issue, you can get your view and I can have mine. And we're living in a serious time now, dear one. Why? Because anybody can believe what they want to be without being responsible to anybody. There never has been a more perilous time than we're now living. Why? See, now there was a time, dear one, when holiness groups are, the Church of God especially. If you go to Maine, they had a standard. If you went to uh, uh, the West Coast, they would have the very same standard. Wherever you see Church of God written across the door, you can feel safe to go there and everybody be preaching the same thing. But they want, now, we're living in a time of vast independence. Yeah. All over the country, people got their personal standard, I got my standard, you got your standard. And don't you know that's serious? That's serious. See, that was a time when you could find safety in the counsel of the multitude. Brethren had gotten together and prayed this thing through and gotten the mind of God and you could be safe to abide by their suggestions. But now, brother, if you don't want to do it, you can say, well, forget you. I ain't going to be under bondage to you. You're not going to put me under bondage and go about your business and nobody can touch you. We're living in serious times, they want. Oh, we're living in serious times. Thank God we've got to stay before God and try to realign his mind within our own thinking. We have got to strive before God to see where the approval really is. And brothers, some situations are coming where we're going to have to know. We have got to go through it all over and fight it over again for the most part to see if God frowns on this or if he smiles on that. And we've got to stay before God until he gives us without any doubt to know what he's accepting and what he's rejecting. And we can't be safe to do otherwise. May God help us. May God bless us. This is a tremendous thing, they want. You know, they want, that's why I tell people you can't make it in the apostasy. When I was in the movement, they want, I was trying to hold standards of divine healing in others. But the letdown was such, the influence was so much that it was overwhelming me. I wanted to do it. I read it in the Bible. But the Bible said, where iniquity abound, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. See, the atmosphere, the environment was not conducive to my faith. So I was out there trying to fight, trying to hold principles that I knew to be right. But all around, I knew I could do it and yet not be criticized. I knew I could do it and be accepted. And the fact that I could be accepted doing it and everybody else was doing it, well, they want, I could hardly refrain from doing it. I said, well, why do all this suffering? And they seem to be doing all right. They did it. Amen. They submitted and, and they still seem to have that shout. So why must I fight day and night? Why must I fight within an inch of my life? Inch of my sanity trying to hold a principle and I don't have to. A free for all situation. Brother, this is a tremendous thing. Unity of thought, unity of practice is in our favor. As a Christ himself is going to determine what he meant by all that he said. You see, they want everybody is preaching the word in some sense or another. Everybody have a right to their interpretation of the word. And people are drawing everything from the same scriptures. You follow me? Well, there's going to be a time of reckoning. That's why we've got the final say will be given by the one that spoke the words. So I've got to get his mind to know what he meant when he said it. Because I can derive anything I want to from it. You and I can debate it. And if I'm a sharper individual than you are, I would win the debate. But I don't have to be right. If I would take a vote, amen, you might get 15 times more on your side than I would my side. But I don't have to be right. That's why Christ himself has taken the judgment on himself. Why? Because he knows what he meant when he said it. 
Then when I've talked to people of various religious groups, everybody had their slants and their views about the uh, rapture, about the millennium, and about this, and about that, and about the other. But Christ knows what he meant when he said it. Amen. Not only that, but everything that pertains to us, he knows what he meant. And when we come before him, he's going to judge us by what he intended. Not what we've derived. Not what we have concluded. But he's going to judge us by what he meant when he said it. And if we take advantage of some loophole, a sinning loophole, then we're in trouble. And God bless us and help us. Now, D1, back to our original text. In the 25th verse, the Bible says, Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now you follow me here because this is a technical passage. Now there are those who holiness fighters feel that because the church needs a cleansing people can't live free from sin. But that is not implied here at all. But what is implied here what is meant here is that before the coming of Christ the church will have accumulated some filth that will have to be washed away before she'll be ready to meet Christ. Well, the one you say, how do you know when she's being washed? Look in the bath water. Amen. Something ought to, some dirt ought to be left there. Something ought to be left behind. Praise our God. Brother held a meeting for us not long ago and Brother, when the meeting was over, people adjusting themselves and making changes and calling me in the office. I said, that's good. But then I can't do this no more. I can't go no further like this. I've got to get out of this. I said, well, get out then. God, don't look, don't look for me to justify you. Get out. If God said you got to get out, the will of God say, get out. Praise the living God. I said, I want to look at the bath water. God trying to wash this thing. Praise the living God. And whatever it takes, don't you look for me to hold you up. Thank God if you blow the trumpet, praise our God and God confirms it. You've got to commit to it regardless to how it affects you. It might revolutionize your whole life, but you have no choice. And brother, it did too. It did. I didn't call him off in the corner. Brother, you're too, you're too tight for us here. You're messing people up. You're breaking things up around there. Help yourself, brother. I but just don't do this and then two years later, be preaching something else. Because I've seen too much of that. People come, pray that we're going to have you measuring up and doing everything else and you find them next year, they preach something altogether different. Because I got more light. If you preach it to me, don't you get nothing else. <laughs> you hold it till you die. You get light on something else. Praise God. But you hold that, you can get light on what you want to, but don't mess with that. Because you mess me up. <laughs> Praise the living God. Amen. Thank God. People are changing their minds at every camp meeting and run your revival preaching one thing. When they come back the next time, they're preaching something else. And then the next time, something else. And they have you going in circles. Praise the living God. Amen. I said, before Christ comes again, there will have to be a special work of washing. A special work of washing will have to be done. Amen. Now you follow it, Dewan. If we refuse to be washed, then we're going before Christ with some things that we won't be admitted with. You follow me? This is a tremendous thing, Dewan. See, now that's what the Bible says, if you, when you think you're stand, take heed lest you fall. See, now, there is a danger in our midst. You know why? Because your standards are a little better than the Methodists and the Baptists and even the apostate holiness people. You got better standards. You know not to cut your hair. You know we don't wear slacks and jewelry well, and television. We know all that's good. But D1 is going to take more than that to get us into heaven. Amen. Amen. You then I'm think I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of standing against the compromise. This is a tremendous thing. The, our own standard. There are a lot of legalistically standard people holding legal standards and going to hell. There are a lot of people in Babylon who are holding, wearing longer dresses than you're wearing. Plainer faith than yours. Longer hair than yours. Amen. Don't put a hot iron and rollers and nothing else in there. Come on! But brother, going to take more than that to get to heaven. Are you praying with me? This is a tremendous thing. Praise the living God forever. 
Washing. What? We have got to be open to the washing of the word of God until Jesus comes again. Every last one of us. And not compare ourselves with ourselves. Amen. Say, I've already arrived and all I can do is just blast babbling, brother. But we've got to stir ourselves. Yeah. We, the washing will have to be done among us. Amen. And when I say us, I mean those who I'm looking at this morning. Yeah. And those of this particular congregation, I recognize that. And that's what I'm looking for when you come. Wash. Wash all you want to. Praise our God. Wash all the color out of it. Do what you want to do. Praise the living God forever. Before we come back, I said there's a special work of washing that must be done. They weren't but sad to say some people have already tolerated just about all of the washing that they're going to tolerate. They said, look, I'm already threadbare, so leave me alone, please. You have a hole in me. All right. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. Do you follow this? Hath made herself. Was well, she the church of God? She should already be ready. Oh no, brother. There was something else in mind here. The apostasy had brought in some things that made her unready. But through the preaching of the pure word of God and the reenactment of pure standards, she had gotten ready again. She was ready now to be presented unto Christ. Just the fact that she had the right name and had the apostles one time in her midst and had held some good doctrine, but that was not enough. Amen. There was a special work before the coming of Christ in the period in which we are living right now that bring the church back where she ought to be before she'll be ready. And brother, we should be engaged in the operation of making her ready. Researching. Sometimes we have a burning service around here. We tell the saints of God to go through your books. And anything that's not conducive to spirituality, that does not build up your mind, and, and that does not make you more steady spiritually, cannot feed your soul, let, let's throw it away. Any old records that, I mean, or even, even a lot of old, old false gospel records and everything, let, let's burn a lot of them up. Amen. Praise the living God. Amen. You got some blouses. Look, get in the mirror. So you can see through them to burn them up. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise the living God. Yeah. Amen. Got shoes to heal too high. I mean, I mean, throw them in the garbage can. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. But guess what, though? Three months later, we have to do it again. Yeah. We have another bonfire. Why? Why? For the same reason that the church has to be washed again before Jesus comes. Yeah. What? She uh, uh, accumulating constantly. Things are coming in unawares. Many people are still boasting about their good stand and have lost that stand they're talking about years ago. They're boasting on the stand they once had. So brother, that's why a washing will be ready before Christ comes. I guarantee you, the one, if those of you who might have had a similar service, have go before God in fasting and prayer. And have everybody to re-examine their clothes and their books and their minds. And see if they want to have another one. Amen. See if they want to have another That's serious to me, brother. After all of the declaration and all the calls and crying, Lord, I got to give up this, I got to give up that. How is it, with that kind of knowledge, you accumulate it all over again? You don't intentionally do it. What happens? Do you see the subtlety of this thing they want? Do you see if we don't have keep our perceptions clear, these things are getting in and we don't know how they got in? We thought we had all the holes sealed up. We thought we were cemented on the inside. Many of you have set pattern for your devotion. I'm going to get up at 6 o'clock every morning. God challenged my heart in this meeting. Come on. Come on. I'm going to stay before God out fast whenever he says so. And if he doesn't say anything, I'll still go two or three times a week. Amen. I'm going to read the word of God. Amen. I used to look at TV four or five hours. So I'm going to spend at least an hour in the word. God showed it to me, he said. And you do it for about three days. And you'll forget you ever decreed it. You didn't decide I'm going to quit after three days. It just happened. It just happened. And brother, that's the way it happens along every line. Why? You decide something. You say, God gave me life. You pray and you vow and you go before the altar and say, Lord, I'll never do it again. I'm through with it forever. And brother, you look around a few months and there it is all over again. 
And if you aren't careful, you'll get tired of keep going through it. You'll get tired of making through it, and you just let us well, I'm forget it. Brother, the same minister I was talking about in Detroit some years ago, he was trying to hold a congregation in check, trying to hold standards, fasting, praying, skinny, but he got tired. And he preached one Sunday afternoon. He said, look, he said, I used to just fast and pray and be worried. It's too much for me. It'll burst my mind. But this is a tremendous thing we're dealing with. The Bible says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Isn't that sad? One who was so spotless in her conception, one who was without fault before God, one who had returned back to Mount Zion again just before the coming of Christ had to be made ready all over again. And brother, she can only be made ready by the washing of water by the word as the, the word as God meant it. Everybody is preaching something in the word. And now they want when you begin to preach particulars, just preach the word, just preach Christ. You have to go into all that, just preach Christ. Well, what is Christ? What do you mean? Christ, 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 Christ. That's what they told me they want. People have gone to congregation, they knew how I stood, and they uh, felt to extend ministerial courtesy. They, you know, offered me to preach. But they prefaced it with, you know, well, you know, people are concerned about this, that just let's, we all just preach Christ. I look, man, I didn't have to preach, you know what I mean? I didn't come to preach. Let me, I'm not looking for no place to preach. So you don't have to try to uh, fill me in. Amen. Washing of water by the word, they want it's going to take the pure word of God to get the church where she ought to be that Christ might accept her. Christ will not accept just anything as his bride. The washing of the water by the word that she might be without spot, no blemishes about her, and he is going to determine. Down through the years, she had become contaminated. She had become contaminated, they want. Sometimes people change it, and the thing they call contamination a year ago, they don't anymore. But brother, what contaminated her back then will contaminate her right now as sure as we are alive. It's going to take a full-time job. Sometimes you wonder, how is it that so many ministers apostatize in their old age? It's grievous, they want. We went to, had an occasion to go to a funeral at an, uh, a apostate church not long ago. And there was a, a, a conglomeration of old ministers who were once warriors. I remember when I first got saved and they taught me how to live free from sin and all this kind of thing. And many of them taught against worldliness. Many of them wouldn't allow certain things in their congregation. But brother, you ought to see them today. How did it happen? They don't even see it that way anymore. I had a few remarks in uh, just a few minutes, and I tried to get all that I could over to me in those few minutes. But brother, it meant absolutely nothing. And I went out to service and talked to some of them. Old oh, ministers, now they're retired now and just coming in and now and then. Their father were old pioneers and everything else. So far from the truth, they've forgotten they were person their old sins. Don't know whether that be a truth. There's something to me that's fearful about old age, about longevity. But I wish the Lord take me before I get to that point. Amen. Before the pressure wears me out. When I'm a, you know what? You can conceive inwardly. You can decide the pressure's too much. I'm tired of trying to hold it like this. You know, I was just telling the saints not long ago. After we had gone through all that pressure from the authorities and from the courts and from everybody else. And right on the tail end of it, the Lord sent us another case, I said. And it looked like the thoughts are going to get back. I said, Lord, this is too much. I can't go with this no more. And you know what? Before I could get myself together, the enemy had given me all kinds of suggestions how to get out of it without going through this. And brother, my mind, I said, holy, let me catch myself here. You know, maybe, well, maybe she can go on and do this and go out of town and do anything. Did I get off of us? Because I'm tired. I'm tired. Amen. But, I, but then I, but I, I, re, I recomposed myself. I said, no, look, if we got to go through, we got to go through. Amen. If we got to face it, we got to face it. Well, then that's what happens to people. You get tired of pressure. You get tired of trying to hold standards. People keep pressing you. People keep running against the door. People just keep insisting they're going to do it anyway. And that's why you just get tired and fold up on the inside. 
And you do like Pilate. Well, I wash my hands. I was, but go ahead and do what you want to do, but I just wash my hands. May God help us. Brother, we're living in tremendous times. I'm going to tell you something. A lot of these young men run around and get their little bags and running out trying to find an empty church so they can start doing something. You better know what you're doing. Praise the living God. You better know what you're doing. You're going to find out some things that you never knew before. But when you get a lot of people, everybody got their own ideas and their own opinions and all kind of predicaments, and you got to try to hold it like the Bible says. Come on. You know that if God's going to bless, it has to be right in everything. And you're faced with all kind of excruciating situations. And it seems that standards are before you that are impossible to hold, but you got to hold them anyway. But you, you wish you hadn't accepted it. You're uncareful. Oh, but may God have mercy. The Bible says the wife has finally made herself ready again. She finally become uncontaminated. She finally washed all of the spots out of her garment. Amen. It took all of the preaching of the word. See, they want, you can't be short along any line and have a blameless church. Why? Because the very point where you're short is the point where the dirt will accumulate. All right, shall we go just a little further? How will the cleansing be done? By the washing of water? By the word? To be? How do you produce? How will we have? About what means will we come by? A blameless church. They want, is that your desire? It's mine. You know my heart was made to grieve when I didn't know about uh, this light as I knew it today. They were having a minister's meeting in the movement in Detroit or oh, maybe over 20 years ago and some of the big ministers who saw the apostasy and saw that the thing had no glory anymore and they had seemingly a final awakening to that fact. And he was in the pulpit crying, Lord, Lord, let this thing shine one more time. He was begging God, let him see the glory one more time in the midst of the people. But brother, the glory had departed for eternity. Brother, that's why we are fighting so diligently to hold it. Once you go into apostasy, you're done. See, now, there's a difference between backsliding and apostasy. See, when a person backslides, he knows he's out, and he might repent and recover. But when you go into apostasy, you are changing light for darkness. See, your whole perception is off. You can't even see it anymore. You can't even recognize it anymore. So there's nothing I can do to arouse you if you don't recognize it. See, people have systematically, that's what the, the Church of God Reformation Movement has done. They have systematically changed. They sealed themselves in as they went. They let down and they sealed it up and said, I won't be free now. I'm a whole lecture. This is it. And then they make another step and say, this is it. There's no need of reasoning. And brother, many times they come, they visit here and say, look, brother, Hampton, why did you come down among us and preach this? I, you've rejected it already. Brother, I would be a hearse and a byword. Why? I used to go to West Middlesex in those places, and there were a few old ministers still trying to preach the standard, brother, and they were made gay laughing stocks. And after they would try to preach, they would get up and chew them up, cut them up, ridicule them. Amen. For trying to preach the standard that brought this church out to where it is, that brought the glory in the first place, they would be trying old preachers, some of them, a few who had not lost their vision, still trying to preach it, still trying to hold it up, brother. And they got absolutely no response. I said, Lord, how is it a faithful city has become a harlot? How is it? How is it? What happened? Going into apostasy. Brother, I could, you could preach all you want to. You could preach all the standards you please. You would be just a laughing stock. It would be a mere waste of time. So then they want those who can be redeemed, those who can be made ready. Who is it? And by what means will the church be made blameless? 
If you want to have a blameless church, you will have to have a blameless ministry. I believe about two or three months ago, Brother Eric was here in a meeting, and he preached on that blameless ministry. I think we got some tapes over there, and he did a lot more with it than I'm going to do with it this morning. But uh, those who are interested, I suggest that you get one of those tapes, brother. You cut it close, and we praise the Lord for it. Amen. Brother, some were disqualified and everything else, but as nonetheless, it just has to be that way. Because brother, one of the quickest ways to take a church into apostasy is to get a blamable ministry. Amen. Let me tell you something, Dewan. We are asking you to put your life in our hands. We are asking you if your appendix bursts and everything else, come and let us know that you pray for you. We are asking you if you get a blockage down in here and if something don't happen in 24 hours, you're gone. We are asking you to come and pray in person to get it cut open. You understand me, brother? We are saying if your little children get a fever of 105 and getting delirious, call us and let us know them with oil. Brother, don't you know I don't want nobody playing no game with people who have put themselves on God like that? Your little children get double pneumonia and everything else. And we are saying, since my child is breathing rapidly, he's changing colors. His fever is 105 and it's still elevating. Will you come? Brother, you don't want nobody playing no game. You don't want nobody experimenting. Amen, brother. That's why just about half of the people who have claimed the ministry right here, I wouldn't let them preach. That's right. Why? Why? Brother, it's more than grabbing a little sack and learning a few scriptures and a few, uh, being able to bring out a few symbols. Praise the living God. To have a blameless church, you've got to have a blameless ministry. Especially with, with what we teach us, dear one. You know, I was just thinking the other day, uh, well, about two months ago, we were having a prayer meeting here on Saturday morning. And my son came to dad. I got a terrible chest pain. I got a terrible chest pain. And uh, I said, all right, it's not ordinary. It's not ordinary. So we sensed something serious. We anointed him with oil and prayed. So he working on a job, had to be diagnosed. And he had pneumonia, so you take off from work. But God touched his body, and he didn't miss a step. Knocked the pain out in two seconds. And he never felt it anymore. But that's why we've got to live close. Yeah. You wake up in the night, your children screaming deliriously. Have same thing with all of that blood draining from their bodies. And they're trusting God. You hear me? All of it. By the pints. And they are depending on what I say to bring them out. They are depending on what you preach, brother. You told them that God would take care of them. You told them that God would heal them. And it's all right, then. I'm, I'm gone. If you don't, I'm gone. Don't you know I can't have nobody play with people's souls? Don't you know that too serious a matter to make those kind of demands of people? And you wonder whether you're right or not? You wonder whether you were called or not? You wonder whether you're really a preacher or not? But I get up in my attic sometimes. I said, Lord, I said, all these people, I said, whatever. They figure that God give me, they're willing to do it. If it means death the next two minutes. If it means I just said it. And the world knows about it. And before you let the church come to that kind of ridicule. Before you let us be a gazing stock, get me out of the way. If I am not where I ought to be, if there's anything that's between me and you, if there's anything that would hinder the success of this case, get me out of the way. I'd rather for you to sacrifice me than the whole church to go under. I'd rather to be sacrificed myself than see the whole church go into oblivion and be brought to disgrace. This is a tremendous thing, brother. Blameless ministry. We got to call the brethren and look, brethren, what about this thing? What about this thing? Are we in a position to let this sister go through this or not? 
Are we ready for this kind of confrontation? There's nothing we can do about it. We're in it. We're in it. Either we do, we, we just tuck our tails and say we're not ready, or we face it. If we are ready. Are you blameless? Is there anything questionable about you? How's your home life? How are your credit? What do your creditors have to say about you? Can your children testify for you? Blameless, blameless, blameless. Over in First Timothy, First Timothy chapter three. I said to be a blameless church, you've got to have a blameless ministry. I'm going to tell you something, brother. God knows this is the truth that I've ever told, brother. If I could decide. Any kind of way that I wasn't blameless, I'd be willing to step down today. Because I couldn't preach the full gospel. It'd be too much to ask other people. People, uh, people are sacrificing their whole lives and everything else because we have we've just indicated that they ought to do it. They have given up the normal things of life just because we suggested. Ask people to make all those kind of sacrifices. And then here I am, blamable. Oh, this is a tremendous thing. All right, I said to have a blameless church, we must have a blameless ministry. This is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. They want that was a time before they would ordain a minister, brother. You didn't just say, I'm called to the ministry, and they get up and put hands on you and give you a little card. No, they question you. They get the word of God and say, do you meet these qualifications? Not only that, but even a deacon. You, they give you a trial period. They check your home out and everything else. They get the word of God. They go into his personal life. Amen. Just like a president, brother. Just like a president. And certainly if they have that concern about a man who is uh, uh, only engaged and involved and responsible for the temporal welfare, certainly those who are responsible for souls should be interrogated. Amen. I think Jimmy Carter went and stole a dime worth of something out of a store when he was a little boy. They brought that up. Those Kennedys one time cheated in school on a test. That was the issue. Everything, brother, is brought to focus. Why? Because th this man is responsible for our whole nation. We got to have a man whose integrity is impeccable. Beyond reproach. We've got to have that kind of people person here. We can have a questionable individual. Amen. Why? Because he might lead us down the road of destruction. The man desires the office of a bishop. He desires the good work. And you notice, to have a blameless church, we said, you have to have a blameless ministry. A bishop then must be blameless. He must be. Now, let, let me, I trust, deal with a thought here, which some might have accumulated. Some things might not affect your salvation, but they can affect whether or not you're a preacher. The same standard that's required for a minister is not required necessarily for a saint. Come on now. I know I'm right. Some people, you're preaching a double standard. There is a double standard. Well, I'll prove it to you. All saints are not teachers. But all bishops must be able to teach. Come on. Come on. Come on. All, some, there are some novice saints, but there can't be any novice bishops. Not properly. Why? There's a difference. And it's brought over from the priesthood. But if you read over Leviticus, I have time to go into all that, brother, but a priest was a particular individual. Yes, there were certain things a priest could not be involved in to be a priest. Why? Because like priests, like people. They know if it was involved in the priesthood, the people, it would be an open door for the people. Amen. This is a tremendous thing. Amen. If a man desires the office of a bishop, if you're aspiring for a pastor, if you're waiting for somebody to die so you can take their place, you better see if you qualify. Amen. You look and pray that God's I hope that's careful so I have my shot at it. Amen. You better see if you qualify. All right, then the bishop must be blameless. The husband of one wife. The Bible says must, and that's not talking about polygamy because that wasn't the issue there. That means he can't be a divorced individual. Cannot be properly. Why? Let me show you something, they want. You've never seen a murderer sit on a jury. Why? They will not have him. They, they, they integrate against you. Why? Because they know you're compromised with other murderers. If you've been a felon, if you've ever killed a person, you cannot be a juror, I guarantee you. Why? Brother, if a bishop is in this predicament, you'll compromise with others. You'll have to. Why? 
You know, well, my case was this or that. This, I don't care. My case was this or that, too. They'll make you do it. You can sit up and, and just explain where there's a hairline difference between your case and their, and their case. But that's why the Bible says you don't have time for all that, so you got to be blameless. Above and beyond reproach. To keep a blameless church, you have to have a blameless ministry. You must have. Now, if you want to sacrifice this, you sacrifice this all that's dear and dear to us. See, some things are option, but some things are not an option. We can get by with it, but I'll tell you what, it'll put us down in the middle of the stream. When we get our backs against the wall, we won't be able to come out. It just is a tremendous thing. He must be blameless. Must be the husband of one wife. He must be vigilant. Must be watchful. Can't allow things to creep in and amen and make nests there. He must be that. Can't be a sleepy individual, a dull individual. All right, he must be sober. That's not talking about drinking of liquor. We mean excitable, making all kind of wild decisions and whatnot and can't maintain his sobriety in trying circumstances. Must be sober. All right. Of good behavior, given to hospitality. Know how to treat people. Know how to deal with people. Know how to be courteous to people. Amen. All right. Apt to teach. Apt to teach. That's a qualification. These are tremendous things here they want. Amen. See, they were already here when we came. And brother, they are uh, uh, accepting people now into the pastorate, into the bishopric, who don't have anything that's akin to these qualities. And they want is having its effect. And people say, all right, then if, if, even if they're guilty of these things, you know what they say? Well, let them prove themselves. You can't, you, you can't prove yourself beyond the word. You've already proven yourself. Because you might uh, get 10,000 people, that's no proof. Amen. Because you get another building, that's no proof. Amen. The word has already proven you. All right. Not given to wine. No striker. That means this is, this is an important one. This is a very important one. It means striker. See, the uh, minister has the advantage of those people. I can stand up and vet my wrath on you, throw at you. You do something to me, I can get you back from the poor pit. God forbid that. That's low. Amen. That's low. That's taking an unfair advantage of an individual. Get up in the poor pit and fight your battles. That's something you want to get off your shoulder and get up in the pulpit and do it. That's unfair before God. I believe you'll be rejected of God. That's low. Thank God if you're not man uh, enough to face and face and face and let it go. A striker. That's brother. Sometimes you can't go to me. You can't go to camp meeting. What do they do? When they see you walking the door, they, they start stoning, they start throwing at you. I mean, I don't care what they're preaching about. When you come, they're going to start preaching about whatever affects you. Uh, they're going to be preaching about the Holy Ghost. Anything else, they're going to preach on you when you come. A striker, a striker, a striker. As soon as you hit the ground, they, they hear you there, brother. They get them a message. A bishop can't be there. Because I have a personal conflict with you. I'm going to take it out from the pulpit. No, sir, no, sir, no, sir. That's unfair. Why? You can't defend yourself. I can say what I want to say. They only hear one side of it. A bishop can't be a striker. You've got to be a, a sober individual. You've got to be willing to let people do everything to you. And you take it before God, not do it from the pulpit. You got to be able to wait until the proper time to deal with it. All right, let's go a little further. Not greedy or filthy lucre. Not draining the saints of God. Come on. Come on, draining the saints of God. Anniversaries. Anniversaries. Appreciations. Car offering, robe offering, book offering. What I'm saying, I'm not being extreme. I know people got all that stuff. A book offering, a robe offering, and car offering, and every other kind of you can name almost. And constantly complaining and contending, brother, to be a proper minister of the gospel and especially a bishop, money or price should not be associated in anything that you do. Do you know we're living in a time now where you almost have to guarantee a person a certain amount to come and run a meeting for you? You almost have to wait until you save up a certain amount of money to give a certain individual, otherwise you won't feel comfortable. When they look in the envelope, pray to God, if you don't have much in there, you see it, the face drop, the countenance drop. 
Every business meeting, they're hinting that uh, my children need some shoes. My wife hasn't had a dress since I don't know when. That's your business. That hinders your message. That hinders your message. Let me show you something. They want, do you know you can destroy your ministry by not knowing how to handle your temporal affair? Did you know that? All we can't pay you, all we can't do this. And people say, well, if you can't have your own affair, you certainly can't run the church of God. You know, John Wesley's father, the great John Wesley's daddy was a preacher, but he had to get out of the ministry why he couldn't handle his temporal affairs. He couldn't handle his personal affairs. And he could not any longer be an example, so he had to leave the ministry. It's serious, they won't. Why? See, you should never have to resort to the saints of God in a begging fashion. Why? You find yourself having to compromise pretty soon. Hinting that you need more, that you are unable to make ends meet. I need this saint, I need that saint. That should never be a time. That hinders your preaching. You can't let judgment like you want to. Why? Because you are too dependent. Come on, you're too dependent and you, all, you end up having to favor somebody. I referred to the things of God. When I came, they would give me, I think, about $15. And I've never asked them for nothing. Else. I got 11 children. I never said, my children need no shoes. And, and my meal barely getting dry. If God don't show it to me, that's it. That'll have to be it. God, I stepped out on faith, and that's what faith is all about. Amen? Yeah. But this is a tremendous thing. See, all these things are inserted in the Bible for a reason. Why? To have a blameless church. Brother, if you're greedy, you're filthy, lucre, you're going to find yourself favoring those who can give more. Those who can do most fire. And it's going to kill your ministry, your influence. And you're going to find yourself having to compromise along certain lines when certain individuals are involved. All right, then. Must be patient. Let's go for not a brawler, not always locking horn with somebody. Come on. You can't first have first matches with everybody in church and think you can preach to them. You don't have to do that, Dewan. Amen. You can't be striving with individuals because they do think contrary to your wishes and expect to uh, have their favor. All right. Not covetous. We just, we're going to hasten on here. One that ruleth his own house. You want everything in your household. Everything that you're supporting should be under your auspices. Thank God you're bringing TVs in the basements and amen, you little girls. Amen. You're supporting them wearing their pants around in your face and everything else. Come on. Come on! Thank God got their jerry curls and everything else and 10, 11 years old. Come on! Their natural hairdos and jazz music and everything in that room. Well, that's their room, but it's your house. Come on, this is a tremendous thing. This is a tremendous thing. Why? Because when the neighbors come and hear it, the neighboring children, Amen. They said, well, I can do it because I heard it at the preacher's house. Amen. I can wear them because the preacher's daughter is wearing them. That's why I say you can't hold a standard in Babylon. You can try to hold, keep your household intact, but brother, all the rest of the saints' children are doing it, and you, I'll tell you what, they'll run roughshod over you, your own children. Amen. They'll run roughshod over you. All right. Having his children in subjection with all gravity. For the man knoweth not how. Rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice. And he goes on, why? Because he'd be lifted up pretty soon. When he get a few members, the uh, church grows rapidly. He won't know how to take it. Come on. He have a little su real overwhelming success, and it'll go to his head. And the devil will puffing up. And then punch a pin in it. And he'll be deflated. And the end will be worse than the beginning. All right. Shall we go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 14? We're going to let you go very briefly. Philippians 2, verse 14. A blameless church do all things without murmuring and disputing. Lord, have mercy. Some people are chronic malcontents. Brother, they do a lot of things, but they're murmuring all the while. 
that you may be blameless. Listen, let you know your blamelessness is not only in the fact that you're doing it, but the manner and the attitude which, by which you do it. All right? That ye may be blameless, a blameless church, and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and a perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Shine as lights in the world. They want we are lights. They want we are in the most elevated position of anybody on earth. We are a city set on a hill. You know, they want, like the Apostle Paul said, if Eden need offend my brother, I won't eat, I won't eat anymore, not only in his presence, but as long as the world stands. Why? Paul said, I am in a conspicuous position. We are the church of God. And rather having my meat eaten question, I leave it alone. Well, it was nothing wrong with eating meat. You could have said, well, you're not going to bring me on the body. do what you want to do. Nothing wrong with meat. Well, they want, but Paul recognized that he would not only affect himself. He might satisfy his appetite, but he might destroy many other souls. So he said, inasmuch as I'm in a conspicuous position, inasmuch as we are light in the, this dark and benighted world, inasmuch as we are the only light, and if our lights go out, if our lights are questioned, then this dark world have nothing to lead them on to God. So he said, do it without murmuring. Do it without complaining. Don't say, well, I'll do it just because you said it, but you know, and go on and have a whole fiasco afterward. We're lights in the world. I would like to read one concluding scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. May God have mercy upon us. May God have mercy upon us. Oh, you young people. You got to be blameless also. My God have mercy. All this excessive playing and lightness. Amen. You got to be an example in the school. Amen. Your speech has to be different. Your dress has to be different. Your whole mannerism, your whole conduct, your conversation cannot be slingish. Why? You are lights. You are lights. You are associated with the church of God. You are saying that's the very best that God has. And you are a representative of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. He's a giving no offense, praise our God, in anything. Don't allow your actions or your practices to be offensive along any line. This is a tremendous thing. Giving no offense in anything. Why? That the minister be not blamed. That we've got to have a blameless minister to have a blameless church. So they want. That's why Paul said, if either me to offend my brother, I won't eat no more meat. Why? I don't want to be offensive. Yeah. I don't want to give no offense in anything. Why? I don't want the minister to be blamed. Yeah, Paul said, this ministry that God has given me, Paul said, I delight in it. I cherish it. I magnify my office. That the ministry be not blamed. They want it. We don't have a ministry that we're willing to give our lives for. We ought to give it up this morning. <laughs> If we don't have a minister, we're willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, but we should throw it away this morning. What the Apostle Paul says, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. In all things approving ourselves, approving ourselves. In much patience, glory to God forever. All these virtues have all but, all, but escaped the church today. In afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, a husband man must be first made partake of the fruit. In strife, in imprisonments, in too much in labors, in watching, in fastings. In one place, uh, further on down in First Timothy, says the minister ought to be temperate. That's one they don't bother too much. Ought to be temperate. He must be temperate. Even all things, excess. You ought not to be a gluttonous individual. Amen. Amen. I think John Wesley said there was a time when, praise our God, if you were too big, you couldn't be a minister. A holiness, you couldn't be a holiness minister. Why? Because a minister, a bishop, must be temperate. 
must be tempered. Why? We are lights in the world. A blameless church. Do you qualify? Do you qualify? May I ask you a question? Does your presence, your association, your membership in the church of God make her a more blameless institution? Does every area of your conduct commend itself to a blameless church? Do you have an attitude that you're willing to submit to what's necessary to make you that way? Young people, old people, are you conscientious enough about this situation? Is your vision clear enough to see where we are, the drastic situation in which we're in, the critical condition that we're facing? Can you see it? Does it matter with you? Are you more concerned about prevailing in your own ideas than you are seeing a blameless church? May God have mercy. Shall we pray? Father, we glorify your name. Lord, unless the church is blameless, whatever else we do will not matter. Extend your loving arm. Have your way, almighty God. Move mightily in this phase of the service. Grant us humility. May we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. May this message be taken in the spirit in which it was given. Lord God, from the old to the young, may we search our hearts and lives. May we realize that the whole operation today is to be blameless. Now bless, we pray, Father, that thou move, give us responsive hearts. Shall we stand? Sing maybe a couple of verses of that same song. Praise the living God. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Praise God. Hey.